I'm Scott Otten. This is Bill Whittle now. Bill, the election is coming up. No, wait, the election is here. It occurred to us this morning that the election is actually happening right now. Some 7 million people across the country have already voted in the 2018 midterm elections. And it, Bill, uh, it used to be that back in the day, there were news stories on an election day when, for example, news uh, was leaked of results from polls uh, that then tilted the election in favor of, of some people who had not yet voted, essentially. There were people in the Florida panhandle who hadn't had a chance to vote yet, and they actually got the results before they got a chance to go and vote. Uh, now we're hearing numbers on a daily basis of all the people who have already voted and what the Republican versus Democrat tilt is. Bill, how does this affect what happens on Election Day? Well, a couple things to cover there. First of all, uh, the networks announcing Florida for Gore cost Bush enough votes in the panhandle to have made that a a decisive win. You know, I mean, it came down to four or five hundred votes or something after 70 recounts. The Democrats still couldn't find enough ballots to get it over the line. So if, if they hadn't called that, that I just think that needs to be said. Um, I got to tell you, Scott, uh, I am uh, I am very much opposed to uh, mail in ballots, uh, very much opposed to them. Uh, I think a hardship ballot if you're uh, in the hospital and certainly an overseas ballot, I'm in favor of all of these things. But Election Day is Election Day for a number of reasons, not the least of which is it's harder to be in two places at the same time on one day. If you can vote by mail, how many times can you vote by mail? How many addresses do you need? How do you verify this? You know, so that's my first problem with it. But my second problem is exactly what you just outlined, and that is that the election isn't really over until it's over. And if you vote three weeks early, two weeks early, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know how things are going to be revealed. You, you, you might change your mind on certain issues. There might be a last minute surge. There might be a last minute choke. I just think that the whole thing is, is uh, I almost said unconstitutional because that's kind of what I want to say. You know, we have an election day and we have an election day once every two years. I don't find that a particularly onerous uh, burden on, on the American citizen uh, in terms of the freedoms that they that they enjoy. And this idea of this being convenient is to me not an argument. In fact, it's it's a it's a counter argument. It voting shouldn't be convenient. Voting should be something that is serious and it's done uh, once every two years and it's and it's treated with some respect and some some majesty even because I'm kind of old school like that. And if you had a, a system, a very simple system, the one that you often use in other third world countries, uh, where you just simply went down to the polls, you found where you were registered to vote, you voted, and instead of them giving you a little sticker, you had a 24-hour die on your thumb, I think we would be very, very, very further along to ensuring the integrity of our election process. Well, given the challenge that we just outlined here, and because 7 million people have already gone to the polls, uh, lacking Bill Whittle's wisdom on this particular subject, and more are going to go to the polls even as we speak today, Bill, I'd like to spend the rest of this episode very briefly having you outline the argument for voting and for voting for conservatives or Republicans to four different groups of people. And the first group I want you ad to address is people who are Republicans, but were not Trump supporters who might be classified even as so-called never Trumpers who, who still don't like the president. All right, let's start with them. Um, so this, uh, this argument is for people who are Republicans and who find Donald Trump so distasteful that they simply can't pull the lever for him. Well, first of all, he's not on the ballot this this November. So if your problem is with Donald Trump, you can go and vote for the for the Republican Party down the ticket uh, without having given any direct support to Donald Trump. If that is if that is your overriding concern. Let me push back but, a little bit but, on that because Trump has been going to rallies around the country saying I am on the ballot. It doesn't ballot. matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We all know it doesn't matter, Scott. He's you're, you're not voting for President Trump in this election. His name is not on any ballot. And so whether he supports people or not is not the point. If, if, if you are absolutely in your heart of hearts determined to keep a promise you made to yourself that you will never, ever vote for Donald Trump, then for God's sakes, get out there and vote for the people that are going to confirm conservative justices supplied by Donald Trump. And you don't have to vote for Donald Trump at all. I would also say I think that the number of never Trumpers and the people who voted for Trump with, uh, you know, holding their nose are certainly not convinced that they were wrong in the sense of decorum and, and uh, 
you know, presidential behavior and so on. I think probably, in fact, many of those people have found even more evidence to, to not like Donald Trump. But it's very hard to argue with his achievements as president. And, and there are many, but I'll just just leave you with two, you know, 4%, almost 5% economic growth and two conservative Supreme Court justices with at least another one or two, I suspect, on the way. Uh, this is worth voting for regardless of your feelings towards this individual. Okay, second group of people. These are independents. And I don't mean the kind of independents who just declared themselves independent because they're really Democrat and they like to uh, virtue signal by saying that they're not captive of any political party. But these are actual independents who look at both sides and aren't sure what to do going into this midterm. What do you say to those independents? Well, I would say to them, um, regardless of your position on social issues, a booming economy is good for everybody. If you're one of those people who who have, who if you're an independent who want to take the conservative position, the fact that the economy is growing at such a rate means that there's more investment, there's more uh, more jobs available. If you already have a job, that's fine. You know they always say that old definition is uh, a, a recession is is when um, your neighbor's out of work and a depression is when you're out of work. But you'll find that most of the people who used to be out of work are not out of work anymore. And not only is that a question of like an economic number that you get to wave around, you know, look, look, there's a 4% economic growth. That number is, is a simple statistic. The impact on the lives of your fellow citizens, and especially your, yourself if you're underemployed or unemployed, is transformational. There's nothing worse than being out of work. I was uh, working out here in Los Angeles as an editor. I know this is not exactly a working in the coal mine story because that's what, <laughs> because that's what my ancestors did in Wigan. Um, but during that strike, I remember meeting with another couple of friends of mine in the TV business, and we thought we were never going to work again. And our day consisted of nothing but waiting for that lunch. You know, we would simply wait for that noon lunch where we could get together, commiserate, and 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 that was our day. Um, the spiritual aspect of people working is something that is extraordinarily important, not just to the country, but to the individuals involved. And if you've got a 4% economic growth with one party and 1% or less with another, that should move you in, in a certain direction. Now, if you're, if you're an independent who leans liberal, then I would simply say to you this, the ability of the government to hand money to people the, and, if, and if you assume that this is completely legitimate, the ability of the government to step in and help people is predicated on large degree by how much money the government takes in. The government either prints money or they take it in through taxes. An economy growing at 4%, even at a slightly lower tax rate, generates far more federal revenues than an economy that's growing at 1% with a higher tax rate. So if you really do care about the poor and infrastructure and all the rest of it, you kind of want to go with the guys that are making the, the economy hum. Okay, so here's the third group. People who are just sick of politics, and it doesn't matter what party they're in, Democrats, Republicans, Independents, Green Party, Communists, they are just sick of it all, and they just want to throw up their hands and say, a pox on all your houses, I don't want to have anything to do with this. Why should they take the time to vote, go vote, and not only vote, but vote Republican? Well, first of all, I can certainly sympathize with that position. Uh, you know, there have been times when, um, when uh, you know, I just said, I'm not, I, I can't, possibly consider myself a Republican, not because of the things that they did, but because of the things that they didn't do. But put aside your particular individual reason for saying a pox on, on, on both their houses, I'm not going to vote. This is something I think that has to be made crystal clear to everybody, crystal clear. When you don't vote, you are still voting. You, you, your decision to not make a decision is a decision, and it's going to affect the outcome of the country. So when you say, well, I didn't vote, so it's not on my shoulders, with with enormous respect, that is a cowardly position to take, and it's an irresponsible one to take. You are a product of a society that has been given uh, to you enormous freedoms, unbelievable liberties, unimaginable prosperity, uh, you know, a country whose, whose primary health concern is obesity, even among poor people. That is a remarkable gift that you were born into. And to say that I want no part of it is, is just not fair. It, it's, it's morally wrong to, to not go out there and, and to be, and if your entire justification for not going is so that you can have the satisfaction of telling people, oh, I don't vote for these clowns. I'm not impressed. I'm sorry. I don't find that to be a virtue. I find that to be a, a form of, of selfishness. Politics throughout history has been just despised. I don't think there's a culture on earth 
that doesn't, uh, throughout all of history either, that doesn't hold politicians in contempt. And the reason for people having such a low um, opinion of politics is politicians. With very few exceptions that you can count on one hand, they're people who are in it for gain and they're not terribly, you know, uh, successful or, or, or in many cases, terribly bright. Um, so the question is, if, if, you, if I can't convince you to go and vote, why would I get you to go and vote for Republicans? If I understand there's nothing out there, but he said, she said, they're liars, we're liars, they're, they're evil, they're evil, they're, they're stupid. Put that aside for a second. The thing that is most disturbing to me about the last, about my life, well, I'll be 60 in uh, April, is that when I was a young person, and probably when you were too, politics didn't touch every aspect of our lives. Politics didn't touch, you know, what kind of car you drove, didn't touch what, you know, what the temperature of your house should be. Politics didn't touch any of that. And, and, that, and that pushing of politics into the entire culture is done primarily by Democrats because, because the left-wing liberal argument is that we need more government in order to achieve these goals. And I'm not putting any bad... Uh, motivations to these people. They think that the best way for us to solve our problems is with more government. If you think that there's a need for more government and more regulation in this society, that we don't have enough government in America, that there are not enough regulations for you to comply with, if the fact that you walk down the street on any given day, you are in violation of any number of federal regulations, could be arrested with felony charges on just about every single person in America for one reason or another, with the taxes or, or whatever. If you don't think there's enough government, then you should go out and vote for Democrats. But look, if you do, if you think that this has gone far enough, if you're sick and tired of politics being in everything, there is one party. Look, I'm not, I'm not going to blow sunshine at you. I'm just going to say there's the party of big government and the party of small government. There's the party of big government, and then there's a the party of slightly less big government. But that's the lesser of two evils, and the lesser of two evils is the lesser of two evils. And finally, I would simply say this. I think the Kavanaugh situation shows when you look... Both parties are trying to get their people on the Supreme Court. They're, both parties are trying to get their philosophy advanced. So I'm not saying that, that well, geez, Republicans are, are, are angels and, and Democrats are, are vile. But if you, look at, if you look at the way those last two, um, if you look at Kavanaugh versus, uh, what was it, uh, uh, Scotty Garrett? Uh, uh, Merrick Garland. Merrick Garland, yes. So look, if you, so let's just try and be fair here, okay? Republicans trying to stop Merrick Garland. Democrats are trying to stop uh, Brett Kavanaugh. If you look at the tactics that the Republicans employed, and you can think of all politics as dirty politics, I generally do too, but nothing that I saw was directed against Merrick Garland's character, was directed against his, his personal life. They maybe have problems with issues of his, of his um, judicial record, but that's, that's legitimate. There was no attempt to destroy him. The Republicans didn't trot out 15 people who claimed that he raped them. The Re Republicans didn't do any of that stuff. And if you, if you despair the civility, uh, destruction of civility in politics, I think it is unquestioned that there is one party that is more responsible for that kind of personalized attack. That's the Democrats. That What they did to Kavanaugh, they can do to anybody. It, and you, you don't have to like it, but it's true. It's Democrats who are in the streets breaking windows and smashing things. It's Democrats of Antifa who are stopping traffic and beating up cars and telling people where to drive. It's the Democrats that are committing all of these violent acts. It's the Democrats that have been doing the things like shooting uh, Republican uh, politicians and so on. They're not equally poxed houses. I agree, a pox on both their houses, but if you have to have a, a, a vote in this, and you do, I'm gonna put a pox on the slightly less poxy house. Bill, the final case I'd like you to make actually is to Democrats themselves. The first vote I ever cast for president in my life was in 1984 for Walter Mondale, and I did it because he said he was going to raise taxes. This was good news for me because I wasn't paying any taxes. I thought Ronald Reagan was going to get us all killed. I thought Ronald Reagan walking out of the negotiations in Reykjavik was the end of the world, literally the end, our last chance of, of survival. I used to passionately believe in things that I didn't know very much about. And, I, and by the way, my last vote for, uh, in, for a Democrat was in 2000. I voted for Al Gore. Not proud of either of these things, mind you. But again, all of this was before I really started thinking about how things work and, and what appears to be true versus what I would like to be true. So I'm not coming at you as a, as a, a voted red all my life, you need to get on the team kind of thing. I'm voting as a guy who's, who's trying to find the best way for this country to go forward. I thought Al Gore was a smarter guy than George Bush. I'm sure he is. And, and I thought he was a, a nicer guy than, than George Bush. 
But what we find is that is that what behaviors actually consist of are not the same as what characters appear to be. We would think that the way to cure poverty is to shovel money at, at poor neighborhoods. And what we find, whether we like it or not, is that the more of this we do, the more poor and the more toxic they become. So I would say to people who, who have lifelong Democrats, I would simply say this, whether you like it or not, your party is the party of the inner city. Newark, St. Louis, Chicago, uh, all of these murder pits, all of them have been governed by an unbroken string of Democrats for 80 years, 70, 80 years, 90, 100 years. It's like 135, 140 years in the case of Atlanta. You can't walk away from the fact that it is Democratic par policies that are driving the murder rate in America. It's not honest citizens living in Plano, Texas, who are shooting each other down. The reason the murder rate is so high in America is because young black men are gunning each other down in these in these pits of hopelessness and despair that have been turned into hopelessness and despair by democratic policies. You don't have to like it, but you can't deny it. So if you're a lifelong Democrat and you love this country and, and you've always felt proud of this country, you have to start asking yourself a few questions. Do you want to be the party of Antifa? I wouldn't. I never would have been. I'd never ever vote for a group of people who are smashing windows and burning down campuses because they don't want to hear a gay man come and speak to them. I'm not going to be a part of that party. I'm not going to be a part of the party that is responsible for these inner cities. And I'm not going to be a part of the party that is that is essentially boycotted any sense of the future so that they can spend money now to get votes. So I would simply say to you the same thing that I would say to myself, which occurred to me personally, and which also occurred to Ronald Reagan, and that is that the Dem you didn't leave the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party left you. The Democratic Party was composed, and still is mostly composed, of patriotic, hardworking Americans. But if you think that the Democratic Party is the party of the working guy, the way you've always felt, you're wrong. The biggest supporters of the Democratic Party are people like, uh, you know, all, all, all the tech giants, you know, uh, Zuckerberg and, and Spielberg and, uh, and uh, all, all of the, all the billionaires, all of the Hollywood billionaires, they're all Democrats, all of them. Donald Trump convinced working people that voting for him was a better move. And when, voted, when working people, when regular little guys started voting Republican, the economy went from 1% to 4% and it put food on the table for millions of American families and it wasn't dependent on charity. They got to live their lives with pride and some sense of control. It's not, it's not abandoning your principles to switch parties. I switched parties in pursuit of my principles. And I would just ask you to consider that. If there's a case to be made for conservatism, for capitalism, for constitutionalism, and frankly, for common sense, Bill Whittle will be making it right here on Bill Whittle Now, and we'll be doing more of this kind of material at BillWhittle.com because of the members there who pay $9.95 a month, not for something that they can get, but for something that they can give to the country and to the world. We hope you join them today. For Bill Whittle, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks to the members at BillWhittle.com for making this possible.